Okay, welcome to the Aramir Roundtable. Uh, today I've got my guest Steve Lentz from Volatility Timer. I've known Steve for a long time and uh, welcome Steve. It's nice to have you here. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity here. Yeah, I've always appreciated Steve's uh, um, methods and uh, his thoroughness with analyzing um, trading ideas and systems and I'm sure this uh, new venture volatility timer will be a success. So I wish you luck with that. And um, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to mute myself so you don't hear any background noises, but I'll be here and uh, um, take it away. You can start sharing your screen anytime. Okay. I'll just share my screen right away here. Go to this. And then I click that little thing down here you showed me. Perfect. Yep. And Let's you see. are good to go i think let's see let's see the this thing needs to kick in there we go perfect yep, we got it <laughs> all right thanks so much i appreciate it um as tom said i'm steve lentz with volatility timer i was with option view systems for about 20 years and uh recently le i left them late last year to start this and um uh, i've been building a website i had to rework some of the algorithms but over at option view I was primarily involved in, um, you know, let me do the disclaimer first at the bottom here, just uh, letting everyone know. Um, we, we, we just have to say this and cover this. Everything I'm going to talk about here is for educational purposes only, including what I show you regarding uh, current market conditions. And it should not be construed as any kind of personalized financial advice. That's not what I do. Um, options trading involves significant risk. And we should know that the risk is, uh, it should be fully understood before you do any options trading venture. So just have to get that out of the way. So I uh, worked at Option View for 20 years, starting out in sales and then worked into uh, running a, a commodity trading advisory. Did that for about a year and a half or so, and then uh, got into the whole mentoring field and uh, did a lot of research. We had Option View research, then we had Discover Options mentoring, and uh, that lasted about 10, 12 years. And during that time, um, one, of the, um, one of the questions that came up, and, was, and, and, and I would hear a lot of educators say this, is that you know, to put on a butterfly or a condor, um, you should wait until the volatility does this or that. Maybe you're waiting for a down day. You know, that was espoused. I've heard that before. Or if volatility is high, you want it to go to a certain percentage of the standard DV. And there were these little algorithms that, they, that were thrown out there, and typically from previous floor traders. Um, and, and, and I always wondered, you know, really is that true? How can you document that? Because I was into technical analysis big time, looking at all the indicators, and I'm a meta stock guy. And, and you know, you get into the bullish and bearish signals. And I examined everything in the context of putting on bull put spreads, etc. But how do you do the condor butterfly? How do you use technical analysis to figure out the best way to put or the best time to put on a butterfly or a condor? And I wanted to answer that. So I went down that path. Uh, during the last few years, I was at Discover Options and came up with an approach. And then upon leaving, I've reworked the numbers and have come up with an advisory that seeks to exclusively complement other uh, uh, efforts to do condors and butterflies and bull put spreads. So I have three advisories. Today, I'm going to show you everything about my condor butterfly timing report. But I seek to complement um, either other advisories or other approaches that you're using. Um, uh, and I, I do not seek to tell you the uh, best way to put on a condor and, ch and alter it or a butterfly and move it around or any of that. I've been down that path. I want to do something exclusively that complements that and brings along a further trading edge from the perspective of when to put these things on. All right. So with that said, here are my three advisories. I have the condor butterfly timing report on the left. Uh, over here. And then I have a bull put spread timing report and then uh, a general market probability report. And um, I'll talk about these at the very end, but let's just get right to it. Um, uh, we're going to go to the one on the left here, SPX Condor Butterfly Timing Report. And just to introduce it, let's say that you're sitting in the market like this 
And the market's been trading in a range that you can see, some pretty established support and resistance levels. And here it's right in the middle. And you're thinking, boy, you know, um, this might be a good time to put on a condor or a butterfly. It's established some support and resistance areas, and it's, it's already starting to channel, and let's just uh, put one on. Well, and as it turns out, you know, in this case, the market, you know, went ballistic in terms of volatility. The directionally, it went to the downside, clearly. And wouldn't it have been nice to have some kind of indication at the time that maybe that time was not the most appropriate uh, time to put one of these on. And so when you go back and look at what my uh, uh, Condor Butterfly timing report said, we discover that it reported a trading edge of minus 5.3%. And so today I wanna show you how we get that number, all right? And then I'm gonna show you a, uh, a report from as of last night, what the market was showing last night. Okay, so this is a process to walk through because it's, um, it, it's taken me two, it took me about two years of hundreds of interweaving indicators in Metastock to come up with that number, <laughs> right? So um, this is my little mark on the options trading world. It's, uh, it's been a joy, it's been an adventure, and I think you're gonna enjoy what you see here. So here are the three, we're just gonna, re three parts of the outline. We're gonna review briefly the selling strategies um, condors and butterflies, just to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm gonna to explain to you the process that I use called volatility edge analysis. And then I'll show you a sample report and then one from last night's close. All right, so just to review things, I'm using option views matrix here and you can kind of, uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and annotate this and see what we get. Let's just try that. Uh, I have to have a color here, perfect. Okay, so whenever you look at an option view matrix, you have the calls uh, on the top and then the puts on the bottom like this. And then uh, normally reading left to right, you would have the different expiries going across the screen. Here we're showing the market price, the midpoint between bid and ask of each option, the implied volatility of the midpoint between bid and ask, and then the actual proposed contracts. And so this is just a ratio iron condor. We're doing a 10 lot uh, of the out of the money bull put spread and a five lot of the out of the money bear call spread. And we're ratioizing it to balance out the deltas. Okay, now this, this is not letting me, uh, okay, so I have to click this and then maybe I can go down. Nope. You have to get out of the annotation mode. Yeah, you know what you gotta do is clear it. Right and then it lets you get out, and then it lets you go down, right? There you go. Click, there we go. Okay, now I got it. But you can see my mouse, so I'll just use that. Typical picture of a graphic analysis screen. I sh assume you guys all know what this all means. Basically, it's depicting uh, an x-axis of the price of the S&PX. The y-axis is, is the profit and loss, and then you have three time frames here. And no matter which way the market goes over time, you can see you get into the profit area. And we're balancing out the deltas by reducing the call side to kind of flatten out that T plus zero line or days to expiration is, zero, is uh, uh, 49 in this case, right at the bottom. All right, and then if you go to a butterfly, or excuse me, oh, and this is the uh, option views, nice view of the uh, uh, price chart showing you the profit area in green. So we need the market to channel around. If it blasts off in either direction, we're gonna get into a money losing situation here. So we're just aware of that, right? These are all range trading uh, approaches that we're looking at. In terms of a butterfly, a broken wing butterfly, uh, this is one where, and, and I like to do this, this format that I kind of prefer is going in the money on the puts to do a, an anchor long. Then you go out of the money quite a ways in the puts to do sell twice as many. And then you go way distant out of the money and do a, a balancing a leg there of the long so that you have a balanced position in terms of 10 short and 10 long. It's just that the distance between these strikes is not uh, uh, symmetrical. Therefore, it's now a broken wing butterfly. And you can manipulate the placement of these strikes wonderfully to kind of lean it long and uh, lean it short if you want, but it can be really a very nice way to create an initial, in this case, the, uh, the, the initial line here can be very, very flat. 
very, very flat. It's, it's just a wonderful way to go. I like to put these on with a little bit of a net, uh, you, you know, with a, with a zero debit here on the right. So it's a little bit above the zero break even so that it's leaning longish a little bit and you take out the worry on the upside. Uh, but this is a broken wing. Similarly, when you go to the price chart, you look at the uh, profit area, you know, the market needs to channel around and not blast off in either direction. So we understand range trading, okay? That was just our brief little review. Okay, now let's talk about philosophy here. Just setting the table for us to understand how we're going to obtain a trading edge on the timing of these. Premium selling strategies, now follow me along here, like condors and butterflies, they do best when the underlying market fails to move more than the amount implied by the options time premium. Fails to move more than the amount implied. We want it to, you know, chop around. We don't want it to move very much. Premium sellers, like us, should seek market environments when this is likely and avoid market environments when this is unlikely. Okay? Pretty simple. So, um, and, and again, as I mentioned, um, we're trying to seek those times when it's likely to channel around. And I, I just really want to come up with a framework for establishing a testing engine, testing the premises that we've heard about when to put these things on. And if you ignore it completely and just pick a day of the month, and I've, I've, I've done that, Okay, well, you say this particular Friday, and I've looked at it from in terms of what weeks of the month are more volatile than other weeks relative to the, you know, the labor report coming out. And I've, I've done everything in, the, in that regard. If you ignore it completely, you're basically just flipping a coin. You ha you, you, we were trying to find an edge here, and we're an edge beyond what your particular up adjustment approach is. Okay, because you can put these on and you have an adjustment approach that's going to get you out of trouble if it gets, you know, kind of goes crazy. We all understand that, but we want an, an additional edge in terms of the timing of the entries here. And that's what we seek to do with the uh, butterfly timing report, the condor timing report here. So to do this, I came up with volatility edge analysis. That is, we understand what historical daily bars were favorable for trading butterflies and condors. So what I'm going to do is go back in time and assign a label for every historical bar. I want to know if that bar turned out to have been a favorable bar for putting on condors or butterflies or if it turned out to be an unfavorable bar right? Because if I know the bars that were unfavorable, maybe there's a way to now filter them out, right? That's kind of what the road I went down. But first, I got to figure out a way to assign favorability or unfavorability. And so once I assign favorability, okay, I can ob observe how well today's market environment did in the past. I would just look at today's environment, go back in time, and see if those are favorable bars. So let's say that last night's market condition occurred 80 times since January 2000. I think that's the number, 80, 86 or something. And if we find out that all 86 of those turned out to have been unfavorable for condors, well then I'm not going to put on a condor or butterfly if all of them in the past turned out to have been bad, right? But if I go back in the past, and look at all 86 previous occurrences of last night's condition, and I discover that all of them turned out to have been favorable for doing these, well, then I'm more apt to put this on, right? So then that way, we're going to now document a positive or negative edge. What I just described was a pretty strong positive or negative edge, but we're going to get down into the weeds here a bit more. So here's the process as to how we come up with favorable bars and determine our edge. And, and so I'll just give you a quick brief preview here, and I'll go ahead and do the annotation so you can more visibly see this. So first we're going to understand the implied 30-day move derived from the VIX and the SKU. Okay? Once we figure that out, we're going to look at the subsequent 30-day actual move. 
Notice I'm not saying IV or his, SV, his, uh, you know, implied volatility, statistical volatility. We convert this to the move that occurred and the move that is implied. I'm going to document the actual number. We then determine the favorability stemming from the relationship between these two. Okay, and then we assign each bar, whether it's favorable or unfavorable, and then we measure the distribution of those historically. Then we look at, we determine our range trading edge by comparing this baseline distribution of favorable bars to the distribution of favorable, favorable bars for past occurrences of our current market condition. And we document it and assign it that number, like I showed you, minus 5.3% for that particular day. So that's just a brief verbiage. Let's get right down to the first part. And I have to go through and do this again. So let me clear all drawing, click this, and we're back. Okay, let's go to the first one. The implied 30-day move derived from the VIX and the skew. Now, the VIX is a single number, all right? And so we can't just use the VIX as a single number to determine how much the market is going to move up and down because when you, if you really want market truth, you need to look at these options. In this case, everything I'm doing is in the SPX, by the way. I'm, I have future plans for maybe rolling out Russell and NASDAQ if there's a demand, but right now I'm just hitting on the SPX. When you look at the SPX calls, as you go out of the money in the calls up above, you'll see that those numbers are lower than the out of the money puts. So the market is implying that if it goes up, it's going to go up a lower level than if it goes down. Yet we only have one VIX number, right? That's a problem. Because if we're going to try and figure out if a bar was favorable or unfavorable, we have to kind of understand what the market was truly implying in terms of its up move versus, versus its down move. There is an asymmetrical expectation of, of, of volatility here. So the VIX just represents one number, but in reality, the, the, the expected volatility is truly asymmetrical instead of just even like that. And we have to recognize that. So, what I do is I use this thing from the CBOE called the SKU. They publish it every day, S-K-E-W, and it measures the magnitude of that vertical SKU that you see here. The fact that the out-of-the-money puts are so much higher than the out-of-the-money calls. As that SKU shifts around, this SKU item here moves up and down. Okay. And so if we're going to assign a certain implied move to the market, we have to divide up the, ex uh, the expected move upward from the expected move downward. All right? Because if, we, if we're, we're, we're trying to figure out our edge and we want to get to the market truth here, and the market truth is that the downside expected move is much higher than the upside expected move. So what we do is when you, when you get right down to it, and I don't want to get into the weeds on this part, but basically the downside volatility, it's best to use the VIX itself. It's best to use the VIX itself. And uh, in terms of the upside volatility, what I do is I have an algorithm where I take the VIX, I look at the skew, I have a pretty complex equation to then come up with a lower number than the VIX, and it took me a while to figure that out and back into it. And what you'll see here is that the VIX, as of this date on August 31st, 2018, the VIX was at 12.9. Okay, The upside volatility turned out to have been 9.6, a much lower number. Okay, so, and uh, uh, with that in mind, we go further. And we can't just take the volatility number. I want to convert these volatility numbers to actual expected moves upside and downside. Because once I have that, I can go and look and see what actually happened. These are implied moves. So as it turns out, when you, when you take the uh, VIX 
and convert it to a 30-day implied move down, it was implying a move down of 3.7%. Okay, the, the upside VIX, the skew adjusted VIX to the upside was implying a move of 2.8% that you see here. Okay, so hope you're sticking with me. And so what we do now, that is the implied level, upside and the implied level downside. So we just understand that. And we're going to come back to that in a sec after we understand the subsequent 30-day actual move of the index. This has nothing to do with option prices. We're going to look at actually how much the market moved. So here's an example here. We want to understand the actual 30-day move or 21 bars. Let's just take this particular day in March of, of last year. Okay, it finished up at 20, 2022. If we go forward, now this is to the upside. We're understanding the move to the upside. If we go forward 21 bars, what's the most that it moved? Because that's what we're concerned about is the highest level of move to the upside. And we would go to that bar right there. That was about a 53 point move in the course of that, within that 21 bar duration. That turned out to have been a move of 2.6 to the upside. And what I do then is I ascribe for that original bar here, that move of 2.6, because that's what happened moving forward. The most it moved up was 2.6% that you see there. Okay, now let's go to the, uh, oh, here we go. What was the implied move at the time? It actually moved 2.6. What, uh, what was the implied move from the options, the, the skew adjusted upside move? Turns out that it turned out it was, it was implying, the, the upside VIX was implying 4.1%. 4.1%. And so you can see then that we would ascribe that original bar here uh, a favorable status. And later you'll see how I paint that bar uh, blue. I'm actually going to start painting the bars favorable or unfavorable, blue or red. So that's to the upside. Let's look at an example of to the downside. Okay. We start here in December of 2015, just for grins. What's the most that it moved to the downside in the course of the next 21 bars? Pretty clear, it plummeted down to 18.12 from 20.78. That was a 266 bar move. Turns out to have been a drop of 12.8%. 12.8%. And then I'm gonna ascribe that number. I go to the original bar here. I note that it moved down 12.8% in the future. And then the next question, of course, is what was the implied move down at the time? The implied move. Now, we're not going to adjust it for the skew, but the skew adjusted implied move, was, well, it turns out that the, move, that the, the, the IV or the VIX, let me see, where am I? Yeah, the implied move down from the VIX itself was 5.6%. 5.6%. So it was implying a move of 12.8. The actual move, excuse me, the implied, what am I saying? <laughs> I'm confusing myself. I got to imagine your eyes are glazed over now as well, right? Yeah, we're keeping I haven't it up. I have done this in a while, so bear with me here. <laughs> I'm no sorry, problem. you were going to say something. Oh, no problem. We're, uh, we're keeping up. Okay. The implied move down was 5.6. The actual move down was 12.8. So I think we can surmise that that bar would be labeled unfavorable. Unfavorable. Where you have the actual here higher than what was implied. And so what I like to do then is now I'm going to go assign favorability or unfavorability to each of these bars. So how do we do that? I'm going to have the upside comparison here the downside comparison, and wherever, and I'll just do my little uh, annotation here while we're at it, wherever you see the implied move over the actual, okay, this was favorable for the upside, but look down here. This thing moved down much more than it was implied. 
So this means that we are, are unfavorable here. So all these bars are going to get painted red right in here. Okay. Then we go over here where we have where the where the implied was much higher than the actual for both the upside and the downside. These are all going to get painted blue. And that's what I do here. Then I oh I have to do this. Let me clear, cancel. Oops, timeout. I didn't like that. C clear all drawing. Cancel, click, go down. There we go. We label these favorable and unfavorable, the relationship for both si both upside and downside, and then I paint them red or blue just like that. Okay? And that's what we do. Now that we know in the past how well it worked out for trading condors and butterflies, and, and by the way, let me ask you this, just digress one second. Just because a bar is unfavorable, does it mean you're going to lose money? No, because you probably have an approach that can account for um, movement and you're going to do some adjustments. Maybe you're rolling and putting more money into it or, or, or whatever you're doing, whether you're trading the road trip or the rhino or whatever, um, you know, um, uh, it doesn't mean you're going to lose money. It does mean if, if you stumble across and you put this on where a bar is unfavorable, turns out to be unfavorable, you will be making more adjustments than if it turns out to be a favorable bar. Okay, I just want to throw that out there because it's, it's not guaranteed you're going to make or lose money, or excuse me, lose money unfavorable. But if it is a favorable bar, I think your approach will have a, a pretty darn good chance of making money if it's, if it's worth anything. So with that done, we now have to measure the distribution of favorable and unfavorable daily bars and get a baseline. So here's what I do. I go back to January of 2000, and I look at the percentage of bars that were favorable and the percentage of bars that were unfavorable. And when you go back that far, you got somewhere around 45, 4,700 bars and roughly 59% of the bars turned out to have been favorable. Unfavorable is 41%. So if you flip a coin and you don't care about market condition or anything, you're just going to pick a day and say, today I'm doing it. You know, you have a 59% chance of landing on a favorable bar. But we want to try and beat that and, and put these on when we have a greater likelihood of it turning out favorable, right? That's our goal. So what do we do now that we know that? Finally, we're going to determine our range trading edge okay, by comparing the baseline distribution of favorable bars at 59% to the distribution of favorable bars for past occurrences of our current market condition. Okay, Let's break that down. Comparing the 59% baseline, flipping a coin, Two, the distribution of favorable bars for past occurrences of the current market condition. So how do we define the current market condition? We're going to go over that, and then we're going to go over just locating past occurrences of it. And then we're going to calculate the percentage of those occurrences that were favorable. Again, if we find out 100% of those past occurrences of today's market condition, we're favorable, well, we're going to be much more apt to load up, right? And vice versa if it doesn't work out. So let's go do this. Here's my definition of current market condition. And I'm, I've been a student of technical analysis for 20 years now. I've explored everything. I didn't go get my, you know, the uh, certified, you know, analyst thing. I just read all, most of those books on my own. And I delved into other parts that weren't covered. I, uh, um, uh, I'm into Wyckoff right now, pretty big, uh, but I've been trying to seek market truth in terms of finding direction and finding edge. And so in that journey, I've come up with these three definitions of condition that give us a three-dimensional perspective of the authentic market condition that we're sitting in today. Okay, I use the moving average, just a 50-day simple moving average to determine trend. If we're above it, okay, we're trending up. 
And the market environment above that 50-day simple moving average is typically much different than if the market is below that 50-day simple moving average. Two different planets sometimes. Okay. Then I like to look at two-day price action. Simply, simply put, I just look if the if the bar uh, was an upswing or a downswing, inside bar or an outside bar. I don't look at the relationship of open to close, unless uh, the situation truly needs it. And I do give myself discretion here. Um, I I cannot currently. In Metastock, which is my platform of choice for all this, um, it, it, because it has built-in, you know, little formula uh, uh, capabilities that let me do this whole study, um, but I haven't been able to systemize this definition to go back and then run a constant compare. Anyway, you know, I do allow myself discretion to change this, and I add average true range occasionally when it gets to be at, at an extreme level, and I want to really capture that authentic market condition. And the close-to-close -close position or the open-to-close position, uh, I just rarely look at that. Um, uh, I find that just simply using upswings, downswings, inside, outside, is enough to capture that portion of the market condition in the context of trend. And then finally, very important, is the stochastic position. Okay, I use a 15.33 setting. So stochastics, basically, all it does is it compares today's close over the previous range, in this case, over the last three weeks. Okay, if today's close was near the bottom of that three-week range, well, that's a different environment than if today's close was at the top of the three-week range. And how, and then the, the trendiness of that position is, you know, lends itself well to really establishing a third perspective on what authentic market condition we're in. I'm going to show you an example, and then we're going to then look at today's report from today or yet last night's market condition. Okay. So here is our market condition from November 12th of 2018. We are under the 50 day simple moving average. Um, the price action, we just had two straight downswing days where the highs, we had lower highs and lower lows for two consecutive days. The stochastic position is that we are, um, the position is uh, between 60 and 100 or kind of near the overbought level uh, area, but it is trending downward. It went over, it went, it just broke underneath its three period uh, signal line there. So if you went back three weeks and looked at this, we, we, we were kind of coming down in terms of our position, our closed position relative to the last 15 days. So when you combine trend, price action, with the positioning of stochastics, you get a perspective on market condition. Now we're going to go back in time and look and see what, how many times in the past was the market like this. So I have this little green ball. And I'm going to go back and look at years and years of data. And when I do this, I'm, low, I'm labeling each bar with that green ball. And you can kind of see how many pop up here, going way back, years and years. And so we, I'm showing you a visual of the past occurrences of the market condition. And here's the question on the table. What percentage of these uh, bars that are duplicating our market condition what percentage of those ended up being favorable for condors butterflies? Again, as I said, if 100% of them were favorable, well, then we're going to load up, right? So let's go take a peek. Here you can see, and I have this indicator, one of my interweaving indicators here, the percentage of bars that are favorable here was at about 55%. It wasn't always like that. It did go, it did go down to about 46% back in 2013-14. But up here, you can see uh, we're finishing this up here uh, at the, in November 12th at 55%. So what we do is we take that number and I generate a report out of it. And here is the Condor Butterfly Timing Report that's going to report the edge to you. And I always report the actual numbers and there's a little uh, glossary down here. Won't get into them too much, but 
I am going to read you the narrative that comes out with each report. So let's just go through this, and I will even do my annotation tool here. So since January of 2000, there have been 4,741 daily closes of the SPX. Of those, 58.6% were favorable bars, where the actual 21 bar movement was less than the skew adjusted implied movement. Okay? Also during that time, our current market condition, and I have a little area where I detail what it is and define it. In this case, it occurred 40 times in the past, since uh, January of 2000. Okay? Of those 40 occurrences, 55% of the bars were similarly favorable for option premium selling. Now that's less than our baseline of 58.6, so that's where we get our, our edge is negative. Negative 3.6%, it didn't even, you could flip a coin and, and theoretically do better, okay, than taking the market condition that occurred on November 12th. So statistically, it's more likely than usual Okay, that 58.6, it's more likely that the current market condition will end up being unfavorable. Okay, the, the statistics are showing it's more likely than normal that it'll end up being unfavorable in this case. And so with that information as a range trader doing condors and butters, you might say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to wait until I see something positive. Why would I want to put something on if it's more likely than normal, I'm going to end up having to do, do, do some fancy footwork, right? So you may, you know, taper off or you may adjust your, uh, the amount of contracts you're going to use. Um, it's up to each individual, but I think this information lends itself well to making more accurate probabilistic decisions using probabilities. Now you just have another factor here to weigh into your decision-making process for when you put these on. So let's clear all drawing, exit out, click. Let's look at um, last night in the SPX. Here is the bar chart from last night. We had a downswing bar on, on Monday, and then we had an upswing bar, higher high, higher low. That was the price action. We are above the 50-day simple moving average. And the stochastic, the 15.33, is trending down and it's between 40 and 80. And I like to give myself a 40 point range in the stochastic. If it's at an extreme, I'll go down to a 30 point range there. You know, if it's up near 90, I'll say anywhere between 70 and 100, something like that. But I give it a range because if I were to make it between, you know, if I were to make it between 55 and 65, well, there's far fewer market conditions that have that narrow. So I have to open that up a little bit, okay? And so, uh, uh, and I do give myself room, as I said. I am gonna give myself room to um, label, like if we were back here at this big bar, sometimes you can have a one day's range that gets over 2%. So then I might add, a, I might say, I only wanna look at the past market condition where we just had a huge bar like this, okay? It's more than just an upswing bar, right? That's an upswing bar of a huge magnitude. So I would wanna go back in the past and look at similar upswing bars that followed the downswing bar that you can see there. That's just an example where I would throw in average true range. But I, the, the, I wanna capture though, I wanna capture that particular market condition. Here was the results yesterday. A minus edge, a negative edge of 2.2%. 2.2%. There were 86 occurrences in the past since January of 2000. Uh, the baseline was 58%. And the uh, percent of, of the, from the 86, 55.8% of those turned out to have been favorable bars for a technically a negative edge of 2.2%. And... Uh, you know, that's what I just, uh, that's what I can report to you um, uh, that occurred. And I mean, would we know why? I mean, I think the fact that the market's trending down lends itself that maybe this is getting ready for an explosion. You have the market trending up. We've had the market pulling back. And I think you'll find that there's, uh, 
times when the market is poised now to blast off to the upside. And if this turns out to be an authentic down move, well, if the market goes down, it might continue on this downtrend because you got more room to go. We're not even below 50 yet. You have more room to the downside on the stochastic range to go yet. So there's some room for a bear market to occur. And I, so that's just my guess there. I didn't go back and look at all 86 individually, but that's kind of uh, what one can surmise from that in terms of the, uh, the possibilities. And so what I like to do is, uh, oh, here's, I'm just going to show you. So, so that's the Condor Butterfly Timing Report. And, and if you want to get that um, a bit of information, I do offer a seven-day no-risk trial. Um, it's 125 bucks a month, which I've looked, I've, I've priced other daily advisories that come out every single day. I think that's a pretty fair price um, uh, for something coming out every single day. And uh, um, uh, I do have, uh, you receive the uh, trading edge each day. And what I like to do is I, I give myself till 11 at night in case I have a, a meeting at night. I'm involved with local politics and municipal things. Sometimes I just am, am, am tied up. But um, uh, I do commit myself to getting it out by 11 p.m. every day. And we email it to you and archive it on my website, volatilitytimer.com. It's a monthly auto renew. It's, uh, you can self cancel when you need to. And um, I include a 12 page PDF manual of everything I just described with, and there with the narrative going on. And I, there's another 30 minute video on my website that goes over this as well. Um, I have other reports. I use the same volatility edge approach to determine bull put spread. Um, timing reports, just similar to the Condor. And uh, there I'm just looking at, instead of if the market blasted off to either direction, I exclusively make it for just the one side, the downside. And I try and determine that. And then I have something called the market probability report, where I go back and look at previous occurrences of the market condition and say, and ask myself, well, what did the market do? Did it go up, down, wobble around? That probability report gives you a much more detailed look and a perspective of, uh, uh, from a statistical perspective, um, what happened in this case with those 86 previous occurrences. And so you can get one report for 125, I give you 10% off. If you get two, I give you 20% um, off if you uh, go with all three of them. And again, there's a seven day risk free trial and uh, you do have to give your credit card, but you can go in and self-cancel um, before that seven days is up just to try it out. Okay. And that's it. Well, looks good, Steve. I, I was looking at the, uh, the market probability report, and it's a little bit different format than the, uh, the others. Um, do you want to take a second and maybe just show that and kind of talk about it a minute? Yeah, let me go find that. Um, let me... Uh... Here I'm looking at my study I did. Oh, where am I? Uh, let me see here. Let me just go to this here. Okay. So this is coming straight from my spreadsheet where I upload my reports from Metastock into here and uh, well, Tom, this is a whole nother presentation, but that's fine. Let me well, I mean, just uh, doesn't have to be a whole yeah, detail, just a high so, level. So this is a report where I look at um, uh, again. I, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the baseline. Let's I, let's just pick every close since 2000. Let's start here, and then we're going to start with the green columns. I take every close since 2000, and I look at each close and ask myself how much did it go up or down in the ensuing five days, 10 days, and 15 days? Okay, and I take the average, in this case, from 4,831 occurrences, on average, the SPX has gone up a tenth of a percent on average every five days. Obviously, we've been in a bull market. Well, we've had bearish markets, but it's gone up since January of 2000. We all know that. 
if you were to take the average five-day change, it's about a tenth of a percent. Every two weeks, it's gone up about a fifth of a percent. And every three weeks or so, it's gone up something a little bit more than a quarter of a percent on average. On average. Now, when you look at those 86 occurrences of, of our current market condition I described, on average, for those 86, you have a five-day move up of 0.13 of a percent, okay, which is a little bit higher than that tenth of a percent, okay? The 10-day um, change actually is up about a tenth of a percent, but that's lower than the baseline here of a fifth of a percent. So there we, it's, it doesn't go up as much every two weeks over these 86. Every three weeks, it goes up, but it doesn't go up near as much as the baseline. So we're seeing here kind of a, uh, um, a mishmash. It's going up here. It's not going up as much there. Um, and so this really uh, isn't that significant. But let's, I want to show you how I measure significance here. And unfortunately, yesterday was a day where it's not that, there's nothing hugely dramatic here. But I want to know, I'm trying to determine if you have a bullish bias or a bearish bias with the current market condition. And what I do is I say, I'm going to take these 86 and I'm going to carve them up into those incidences where the market ended up going above that day, the previous day's high, okay? And those are current, and there were 45 of those. And then what happened when the market went down below the previous day's low? Was it hugely bearish? Okay, and was this hugely bullish? And so over here, I take all of, uh, those 45 occurrences where, where uh, every current condition closed, where the high exceeded, um, the next day, where the high was exceeded the next day. And in this case, of those 45, the market on average, of those 45 occurrences on average, you had a five-day change of about half a percent. Now, that's much higher than the tenth of a percent. Do you see that? So there's a bullish bias there. And is that bullish bias significant? That's a difference of about 39% or excuse me, 0.39, not quite a half a percent difference to the upside. How significant is this? Is that a big deal? I mean, it technically is to the upside about five times, right? Well, what, I, what you do then, in, in the world of statistics, there's something called Z-scores, okay? And what you do is you take this difference, which we might at first blush think is a big deal, but you divide it by the standard deviation, okay, the, the, that created that point 0.1 there. And when you do that, you get a Z-score of about a half a standard deviation to the upside. That's what that's showing you. A Z-score of 1.0 is a full standard deviation to the upside. This is a bullish bias of about half a standard deviation to the upside. The other scores are much lower that you can see here, and you're not going to get too excited. But when you see Z scores in here of over one, and they do occur, now you're going to get excited about the bullish bias of our current market condition or the bearish bias of our current market condition. Okay? And so um, that's what I like to do. And, and I just want to look at the current market condition and say, look, was, is this thing likely to go up or down? Let's go back in the past and look. And this is how I measure it, is using Z-scores like this. And then I like to look at the realized volatility. We, so others call it historical or statistical volatility. You know, the baseline, on baseline, the market is basically moving around on average at, at, a, at a historical volatility, or I call it a realized volatility, of between 15 and 16%. That's on average. And we know in a bear market, the move is much higher. In a, in a bull market, you have realized volatilities that are much lower. And so um, our current market condition 
on average generated a, a realized volatility, and these are, these are annualized levels taken from the 5, 10, and 15-day levels, between 12 and, say, 13.5%. If the market goes up above the previous day's high, you have a much lower volatility and than if it went, were to go down below. Well, not much, but there's a small difference there. It, it typically is a higher volatility if it does break down. So with this information, you know, as a range trader or even as a directional trader, you're going to get a much greater feel for if the market is likely to go up or down. Some days you're going to get these low Z scores where it's, it's pretty much a turkey shoot. Just flip a coin, basically. But you want those Z scores to be pushing upwards of a full standard deviation. Now you're talking and you can start making more uh, uh, probabilistic decisions. Uh, that way, or better, more accurate probabilistic decisions with this additional data. So I see on your site there's a um, um, an example, and the Z scores. Uh, let's see, the five day for the um, it was 1.24 going up and 1.25 yeah. going down. So how do you reconcile when you have that kind of situation? Yeah, well, when you have that, well, then you're going to really watch the next day's action, right? Uh, where, where you, you can have market conditions where um, the, if it breaks up or down, and, and Tom, that may have been from having maybe an inside bar under oh, more right. dramatic conditions or an outside bar, or there's market conditions where, yeah, if it breaks up, it's going to really move. If it breaks down, it can really drop. It's just, uh, and you just go back and you can see that, boy, I mean, that's, you can be on those little precipices of, of market action, pretty volatile moves either direction like that. Right. And like what you're seeing here is, well, when you go out three weeks, you know, today's, today's market action, either going up or down, eh, you're at a, what, 16% of a full standard deviation to the upside, 17% of a full standard deviation to the downside over a three week period. Eh, you know, you're, you're not good. That's not really going to, you know, give you a whole lot of additional information. This might give you a little bit to look at, but you, you know, it's, uh, uh, you, you, that's just the way statistics can work out, you know. And one thing I like to do in, with this is, instead of just putting in today's condition, I use this engine, so to speak, to then take people's um, assertions that certain technical setups are in the bag bullish or in the bag bearish, right? So you could take a moving average crossover. I can go back and look at how many times that occurred and did it have any kind of Z-score up or down, right? And um, I'll, I'll tell you what, 70, 80% of what you read in terms of, of bullish and bearish or, or these uh, um, candlestick patterns, combining candlesticks with stochastics and filtering this and that, what's the authentic Z-scores up or down? Often it ends up being way less than a full standard deviation and often under a half a standard deviation. And sometimes you can actually fade the trade and do pretty well. So uh, it, it, it really kind of opened my eyes to what's really going on with a lot of the technical analysis philosophy out there. And most often I think people will take their trailing stop and optimize it uh, to that data to show that this approach works or, or whatever. And uh, what the Z-score does is it takes out that whole trailing stop optimization approach and uh, you're able to see it for what it is. Is there a bullish or bearish bias? That's what this answers. Well, very good. Uh, I'm, I really like your uh, research. It's very thorough, Steve. So yeah. Thanks for that. Well, I enjoy this. And uh, again, I just want to do something that complements uh, what you guys are already doing. I mean, you guys, you know, Tom, you and I have known each other a long time and uh, really respected your work and the work of, of everyone that you work with and those approaches and everything that you teach. I think they're outstanding. And this is just meant to kind of uh, assist, further assist. Well, any help is always appreciated, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Steve. Well, I don't see any questions. So, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, no. Just go to the website, give it, give it a good uh, look, and I'd appreciate if you want a trial, please sign up. And of course, you can email me with any questions you have along the way. 
And that's volatilitytimer.com. Correct. Just, okay. Yep. All righty. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Bill says thank you and uh, I look forward to uh, having you on in the future and uh, give us some updates of how you're doing. Oh, absolutely. Would love it. And I'll give you a call after we're done here. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tom. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. All right. Real good. Bye-bye.